Jnanamagyanatamarandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanye Natasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kalpata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanabhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Kedadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 We're studying the first unit and we're on lesson number Oh, I forget <laughs> Lesson number today. Recording in progress. Oh, today we're on, we're, we're into the, the yoga ladder now. So there's unit two, and this is lesson two, the yoga ladder. Yesterday we went through the first lesson of the yoga ladder very quickly. So we'll have a review of it today. Let's see. Hmm. Oh, overview of the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. We covered, do you remember the overview of the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita? We spoke about Karma Yoga, right? And we spoke about Karma Sanyas, that Karma Yoga is better than Karma Sanyas. And we spoke also about the Acharya principle. And we gave the example of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna himself is an example of somebody who works, although he doesn't need to work. And then Janaka Maharaj is also there. He doesn't need to work, but he works because the example is very important. We have to teach by example. And then at the end of the third chapter, Arjuna asked his question. Who remembers what is Arjuna's question in the third chapter? Yes, who, who remembers? Arjuna's question in the third chapter? Hare Krishna Maharaj, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead Prabhu. Yeah, Arjuna said in uh, text number 36, O descendant of Krishna, by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? Yes, yes, thank you Prabhu. And then Krishna it replies in some detail to that question and he explains that the cause of the cause of uh, lust it, first where, where it comes from right is a lust only or jun born of contact of the material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath and it's an all devouring sinful enemy it burns like fire and never satisfied and it's situated in the senses and in the mind and the intelligence and we should conquer that lust by regulating the senses and cultivating spiritual knowledge. So like that, that was explained at the end of the third chapter. Then we we, we explained a little bit about the, the practices of Karma Kanda, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Dhyana Yoga. All right? The practices of these different yoga systems. Karma Kanda, people will practice Karma Kanda, how, generally they will worship the demigods when they do Karma Kanda activities. That's usually the process. They want to get material benefits and they will often worship the demigods for that. And karma yoga, how, do they, how does one perform karma yoga? What should he do? Without a 
attachment to the results. Yes, but what kind of work he should do? Just anybody's work? Prescribed duties. Yes, his prescribed duty in a detached manner, right. And then jnana yoga, one has to cultivate knowledge. One should cultivate knowledge by jnana yoga. Understanding, for example, the, the nature of the material world and how because of the senses we engage in so many activities which bring us misery. So that is jnana yoga, cultivating an understanding of the nature of material existence and learning to control the mind and senses, right? And then dhyana yoga, dhyana yoga, we haven't studied much about that yet, we'll be looking at that, but dhyana yoga is about uh, going to a secluded place and sitting down on a kusha grass and controlling the mind, fixing the mind on on the Supreme Lord, meditation. But meditation not just in home, you have to go out from the home and you should go alone, you should sit on a deer skin and, and you should sit very straight. And so that's Dhyana Yoga, it's described in chapter 6. Right, we'll be looking more about that. Then identify contemporary philosophies of life which relate the principles of these yoga processes, contemporary philosophies of life. Yeah, different uh, people, especially Karmakanda, very common people are interested in material benefit. So there's a lot of philosophies about that. People want to get material enjoyment, worshipping different devas. People have their own philosophies about material existence. Karma yoga is... Karma, can, karma yoga can be more based on giving the results to others. We see, for example, social work, welfare institutions and so on for the benefit of others helping the needy and the underprivileged. And jnana yoga is a process of philosophical speculation, mental speculators, the Vedanta societies and so on, they're all doing jnana yoga. And dhyana yoga, dhyana yoga people do some kind of attempt at astanga yoga, often they only practice the asanas. And the yama and niyama, which are the first two steps of the astanga yoga, they don't care for. So dhyana yoga, they imitate. They sit at home and pretend they're meditating. So people do like that. They think this is their yoga. They're not actually following the real principles of dhyana yoga, but they, they try in their own little way. They compromise on a lot of the principles. All right, so then we also analyze Krishna, Krishna we, we talked about Krishna's analysis of lust and how we could apply these principles in our own practice of Krishna consciousness. Particularly we want to try to be regulated in Krishna consciousness, try to be regulated in eating and sleeping and recreation and work and be very conscious, try to avoid anger because anger is the younger brother of lust. So we want to be careful about controlling the mind and senses. The best way is to keep ourselves fully engaged in Krishna consciousness. All right? Are there any questions on this, these points which we discussed yesterday? Anybody has any query before we go on? Yes, Maharaj, there are two devotees who raise them. Yes. Hare Krishna, Dhanavad Pranam Maharaj. 
Maraj, is Karma Kanda people do follow uh, Vedic principles? Yes, they may follow Vedic principles. Yes, Karma Kanda is discussed a lot in the Vedas. The majority of the Vedas are describing Karma Kanda. Then sense enjoyment, Maharaj. They do sense enjoyments. Yes. Yeah, the Vedas talk about sense enjoyment. Yes. What is the difference between Karma Kanda person and the Karma Yoga person, Maharaj? Well, the Karma Yoga, the Karma Yogi, he's a transcendentalist. The Karma Kandi, he's on the material platform. Therefore, you see in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Trigunya Vishaya Veda, nice Trigunya Bhavarjuna. Lord Krishna is saying to Arjuna that the Vedas deal with the three modes of material nature. And Lord Krishna advises Arjuna, rise above the modes, O Arjuna, be transcendental to them. Lord Krishna encourages Arjuna to transcend the path of karma yoga and come to at least to the platform of to transcend karma kanda and come to the platform of karma yoga. Karma yoga is on the material platform. You're still in the modes of nature. But karma yoga is transcendental. You can become you can be transcendental on that. Manish, what will be the destination for a person in Karma Yoga? Well, we'll see. We'll, we're going to discuss that today. And, and to, uh, I think today we'll look at that. Karma Yogi, generally, you see there are different kinds of Karma Yogis. There's the Niskam Karma Yogi and the Sakam Karma Yogi. The Sakam Karma Yogi is someone who is more attached to the results of his work. But the Niskam Karma Yogi, he sacrifices all the results of his work. So the, the Karma Yogi, he, he can go up to, the, up to the spiritual world. He can go up to the, the, into the spiritual world. He can, sometimes Karma Yogis can be impersonalists. Sometimes, you know, it's possible that a karma yogi is an impersonalist. He's not actually devoted to the Supreme Lord. He's just detached from the work. He's detached from the results. But his motive may be to enter into the Brahman. But the karma yogi can also go on to become a devotee and go to the spiritual world. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. And Rishi Kesh has a question. Hare Krishna Gurudev uh, Maharaj once again. Uh, uh, I just wanted a little clarification on uh, verses 41 to 43. Just one question, uh, summing up all the three verses. Uh, uh, 41 says, In the very beginning, curb the great symbol of sin, by regulating the senses and this is the point by regulating the senses so importance has been given to regulate the senses and my understanding is because they are uh, they, 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 uh, they are not as subtle as the mind or the intelligence so they are the easiest one to control but when we go to the next verses even in the purports the importance is given to intelligent control of the by the self or by intelligence or by mind and there's a mixture of importance on mind it's not very clear as clear as in verse 41 where it says control the senses full stop it says clear but the next verse is do not clearly say what they want us to control first they rather make it a bit muddy or probably muddy for my neophyte mind. Can you please clarify on that? Well, you did mention in the beginning, right? In the beginning, control the senses. So, in order to control the senses, we do, it does involve the mind. We cannot expect to control the senses without the help of the mind. And so, the mind is certainly going to be involved there. The mind is used to engage the senses in different activities. 
Maharaj, sorry, I'm interrupting here, but in, in text 42, I looked at the purport or the, or, or the explanation by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, and his first line says, one should not try to conquer the mind and intelligence first because it is impossible. <laughs> so mind cannot be used. That's what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says in uh -huh. his commentary. Uh -huh. It says, one should not, I repeat, one should not try to conquer the mind and intelligence first because it is impossible. So, and in the purport of 42 also, Prabhupada says in the last paragraph, a neophyte spiritualist is generally advised to keep aloof from the objects of the senses. Basically means sense control, which is what verse 41 says. Yes. And then he continues, Prabhupada continues, but aside from that, one has, one has to strengthen the mind by use of intelligence. In a neophyte stage, a person may not even know how to control the mind. That's why he's being regulated. He's being forced. He's been given some directives by his advanced devotees. Do this. Don't ask questions. Do that. Don't look there. Only look at Prabhupada's books. Don't look outside. So that's regulated. And it may make sense at a later stage to this devotee. But when we say, but as such, that, that control cannot come through mind. That control only comes when someone gives you a direction. If, if, if that's how we have to take verse 41. In the beginning, curb it by regulating the senses. Yes. There is no mind involved in this. Well, there is. You, you definitely, there's a mind is involved in regulating the senses. The senses, the senses act under the direction of the mind. Right? It's a mind. It's a mind which is engaging the senses. The mind tells a hand, pick up the food, put it in your mouth. It doesn't just happen automatically. We get the direction from the mind. And if intelligence is higher than the mind, then we should say, or if the self is higher than the intelligence, then intelligence, mind, as senses all lose their importance. Might as well let's control the self. How do we control the self? Well, that is Krishna consciousness. We have to surrender, Krishna. surrender to Krishna. Krishna consciousness will start with some rules. Yam, niyam. Even, <laughs> even if it is a nectar of instruction, we have Shadavir Bhakti Vinashati and text 2 and text 3, they advise us what should we be careful of, what we should not be. Yam and niyams are those. Those are our do's and don'ts. So isn't that controlling our senses? Yes. It's not mind involved. It's, no. It's, <laughs> mind is always involved. The mind is always there. The mind is over the, overseeing the senses. We can't say the mind is not involved. Because it's the mind which directs the senses. And we have to, as you said, it's coming from the self, right? So that we take shelter of the ultimate self, the super, the super soul, the Lord in the heart. We take shelter of him. And where is that super self? It's not just only in the heart, but we take shelter of the, ex, the external manifestation of the self, which is there in the form of the spiritual teacher. So the spiritual teacher is there. He is the manifestation, he's the external manifestation of the super soul. And he's there to guide us, to tell us what to do. But how does a neophyte know the self? We hear about it from Bhagavad Gita. We hear. Maharaj, if we, if we are at the stage of Bhagavad Gita or understanding Bhagavad Gita, we are already at a higher stage than a neophyte. Well, no, not necessarily. We're, there's, the, we are still neophytes, even though we're still, you may say we're studying Bhagavad Gita, we're not neophytes. No. Yeah, definitely, you can still be a neophyte, we can be studying Bhagavad Gita. 
Maharaj, could the interpretation be, when I'm looking at the last paragraph of text 42, Prabhupada says, a neophyte is generally advised to keep aloof from the objects of senses. But aside from that, the mind has to be strengthened. Could we say that at a neophyte stage, even if, as you rightly said, okay, if we, even if we are studying Bhagavad Gita, that doesn't mean we are not neophytes. At a neophyte stage, could we say, yes, we need to put more importance to control of the senses by regulative methods, Vaidhi Bhakti. But as we slightly advance, we need to consider controlling the mind in a more serious manner. Is that correct? Or will that work as an interpretation? Yes, definitely. As we, as, as we go on, we have to control the mind more and more. We have to control the mind. That, at every stage, the mind has to be controlled. In the Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. In, the, in the beginning, it's a neophyte. Of course, our mind is restless and obstinate. There's so many thoughts entering into the mind. But still, we make use of the mind to engage it in hearing about Krishna. We absorb the mind. We hear about Krishna. We chant Krishna's name. Of course, sometimes Prabhupada would simply say, it's not a question of the mind. He said, we just use our ears to hear and our tongue to chant. So that is the beginning of Krishna consciousness. That's our neophyte stage. We use the tongue and the ears. And gradually the mind is drawn to hear about Krishna and to think of Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. That helps because this interpretation that we just discussed in the very end is neither given by Bal Balevide Bhushan nor by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, but it seemed to be a correct, so I wanted to confirm it from your mouth. And thank you very much. That, that helps. Okay. Thank you. So we'll go ahead. Mm. So we're going to look at the yoga ladder here and we'll see how the different yoga systems relate and connect to each other and what their goals are. First of all, Karma Kanda leads to Karma Yoga. So from the chapter 3, text number 11, Purport, Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada has described, by performance of yagna, one's eatables become sanctified. And by eating sanctified foodstuffs, one's very existence becomes purified. By the purification of existence, their tish, finer tissues in the memory become sanctified. And when memory is sanctified, one can think of the path of liberation. So Srila Prabhupada is describing here how we offer our food to Krishna and how we eat prasada. And so in, in the beginning, you know, simply doing a yagya, it's, we could think of it offering the food, it could be considered like karma kanda. We just simply, we're, we're doing the sacrifice, and somebody may offer the food to Ganesh, somebody may offer to Shiva, devotees of course will offer to Krishna, like that. So the path of karma kanda is a bit like that, that people don't have a clear idea about who is the supreme, but they want to do some kind of sacrifice, so they offer the food. And the devotees, we are offering to Krishna, and we go on, ultimately we will eat sanctified foodstuff and in this way advance. So eating, very important part, of course everybody has to eat. We like to, we want to eat prasadam. And just by eating prasadam, one can make spiritual advancement. And neophyte devotees are encouraged, eat more prasadam. It's important for devotees. Prabhupada would like to feed the devotees prasadam. He knew that it would keep them in Krishna consciousness. Okay, so here you can see the yagya, and they're doing worship, and the Lord is coming, and He's accepting the offerings. 
Lord Vishnu is coming to accept the offering of the yagya. Lord Vishnu is worshipped in all yagyas as the chief beneficiary. So this is the system of sacrifice. Of course, we want, we want to please Lord Vishnu, we want to make a nice offering. Here from Bhagavad Gita 3.15 Tasmat sarva gatam brahma nityam yagne pratishtitam The all-pervading all transcendence is eternally situated in acts of sacrifice. The all-pervading transcendence, meaning the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Lord in the form of the Super Soul, he is situated in acts of sacrifice, eternally. So when we offer a yagya, it's for the pleasure of the Lord. Oh, here's a little exercise for, for the devotees. See if you, can perf if you can do something with it. Respond with reference to Bhagavad Gita 3.10 to 16. Respond to, with reference. Let's see the question. Okay, first one. Just let's see if, if you can respond to this. You meet a gentleman at a home program who criticizes ISKCON for neglecting to worship the demigods. All right, how many people do we have here today? We have 43, Maharaj. 43, all right. So we want to have three groups, uh, or we could have six groups, six into 43, but seven, six. About seven people in a group, I mean, we can have six groups, all right? Can you, can you, can you arrange it, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Right, so the first, the first two groups will deal with this question. How would you answer it? You meet a gentleman at a home program who criticizes ISKCON for neglecting to worship the demigods. You have to respond with the help of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verses 10 to 16. All right, that's the first question. Then the second question. Second group means group 3 and 4. And it's a talkback TV program. has a section on environmental issues. The interviewer has invited you on the show to discuss a spiritual solution to our environmental challenges, the Vedic perspective. Right? A spiritual solution to our environmental challenges, the Vedic perspective. How would you respond? How will you deal with it? And then the third group, in our modern technological society, it's believed that by intelligence and use of natural resources, man can produce all his necessities. The notion that there are demigods who supply heat, light, rain, etc., and who should therefore be supplicated is considered a primitive absurdity. How are you going to respond to this? It's a real challenge. All right? Is it clear? So three, three questions there, and we'll have six groups, so there'll be two groups dealing with each question. Yes, yes, ma'am. Is that, have, have you got the questions? Maybe, maybe you have to tell the devotees what group they're in so they can make a note of the question. Yeah, so Maharaj, first question is why neglecting demigods? Second is related to environment. Uh, how like we can do by natural um, 
by our progress we can uh, yeah, so yeah. Yes. spiritual solution to our environment challenges yes okay and the third That's question okay. and the third question is uh, why demigods okay yeah the demigods are just some primitive absurdity. They're not, in, in other words, it's mythology. It's yeah. not, not actual real. There's no reality to this. And there's no demigods supplying everything. No. Men produce all the necessities. Men do everything. All right? Okay. So we have to give you 10 minutes, I think, to, to look at this. And you have to refer to text 10 to 16, chapter 3, and see what you can come up with. All right, Prabhu, did you make the groups? Yes, we have the groups ready. Okay. Can ready to break out. Um, Maharaj, did you mention that to call out um, and specify who is part of which group? Uh, no, I didn't mention who is part of which group. Okay, yeah, no worries. But the first, so, the first group one and group two will deal with the first question about why we neglect to worship demigods. And then group three and group four will discuss the environmental challenges and the solution from the Vedas. And group five and six will talk about the, the actual reality that there are demigods and it's not just simply mythology, that there are some controlling intelligent beings behind the world, behind nature, that everything is not done by man. Okay, so we can break into groups. Yeah, okay, I'm setting a map now. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So which group are we? We are in group five. Five. Group five. Oh, group five. Okay. So we have the challenge to deal with these very atheistic, materialistic people who don't believe in any higher intelligent beings above humans. They think men are the God Himself. So, without even looking at the texts, you might be able to think of some arguments which we could come up with to convince people about some intelligent beings in the, in the universe that men are not supreme. And we see actually men have, not, men have not done any real good for the planet. They've created a lot of havoc on the planet. What have we actually done for the good of the planet? What has man done? Uh, Maharaj, we can give the example of uh, the planets. So many plan planets are revolving in their own orbits, and uh, it's, uh, someone has put those planets in the. Uh, Prabhupada gives this example uh, that so many uh, solar system and uh, and the planets are revolving in their orbits. 
someone there is superior intelligence and uh, in bhagavatam i think prabhupad uh, gives example that man is creating some machine and then you have a man has and god has created such machines which it can produce more machines without intervention of uh, like manual intervention it can keep on producing more machines yes what what are some examples of nature producing more machines marad the example of a seed giving a birth to a tree like uh, it contains a complete tree in itself oh yeah okay good yes from one seed so many more trees come so the trees generate themselves without the help of man we can cite the damage which men have done to the planet the humans how much damage they've done how they've polluted the atmosphere and we have global warming we have uh, we the crops which we produce are all vastly inferior to what they were in the past because everything is full of chemicals and and we've also done a lot of harm to the mountains we've broke away damaged so many mountains and just to build houses for people we've damaged and uh, made dams which have created so much problems for the the countries different countries we've chopped down the rainforests the rainforests have also created a lot of because there's no rainforest so you don't get the rain we used to get so what is what good have men actually done for the planet have they done any good for the planet very difficult to think of any good which they've actually done for the planet but everything was actually there by the grace of god prabhupad describes how in the past the oceans were full of gems like pearls and coral valuable stones they were all there in the ocean and in the mountains also there was gold and silver these things were all there they were gifts of god even even maharaj can i say one point yeah please even the recycle process which man took from the nature anything doesn't go waste so that is also nature is it, it is designed by someone yes yeah. good yeah the recycling which is there just like the oxygen which is you know from the trees you get the you get the oxygen and men breathe in the oxygen and they breathe out the <laughs> the carbon come the carbon monoxide and the, and, and the trees bring breathe in and create more oxygen photosynthesis a modern technology cannot produce uh, grains on the other hand by performance of yagya oh. rain comes yes very good yes can men produce any grains in their factories no but by yagya if we do proper sacrifice then we get nice wholesome nourishing food stuffs it's actually seen where the people are pious then the land yields more i know when the people are not actually atheistic and godless then they suffer they suffer droughts and pestilence and so many problems come
What do you say, Prahlad? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, can we also say that uh, when men, they try to manufacture something, they use other uh, raw materials that come from nature. So they come from God here. Yes, right. Yes. And that everything which they produced, their motor cars and their computers and everything, it's all, they need basic resources which all come from nature, provided by God, ultimate. Well, where did it come from? They will say, well, it's just by chance. It doesn't come. There's no God. They, they don't believe in God. So you're, you can't just say God because they don't believe in any God. They just say, no, it's nature. It's just by chance it's all there. Everything is chance for them, materialistic people. They don't see God anywhere in their creation. So if you start talking about God, they say, that's your sentiment. And you have to explain it in a different way. You have to ask them, where does everything come from in the beginning? All the natural resources, where, does it all, where is it all coming from? They say, oh, it's just there, just by chance. Maharaj, we have uh, natural resources like uh, gas, fuel, air, water uh, supplied by God. Uh, but when it comes uh, with regard to modern technology, it becomes commercialized. There is mismanagement, exploitation, everything happens. Yes, right. When the humans, when the human being comes in, when man comes along, then it all goes Chaos. Everything falls apart. Good. Maharaj, um, on the point that you brought up saying that uh, our current scientists don't believe in the existence of God, can we say like just in you know the current day how um, a piece of art uh, is there because there was an artist and there are laws in a certain stage sorry, of sorry, 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 we just need to choose as representatives. Okay. I would request Mukesh Prabhu or Jivan Gauri Prabhu. Sure, Guruji. Jivan Gauri Prabhu, would you like to move? All right, so I'll, I'll take us down some points and uh, try to uh, cover all of them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Prabhu. We have 30 seconds now, buddy. So, Maharaj, uh, saying that, you know, how laws are there because of a lawmaker, can we also say that uh, natural laws of physics and, you know, um, the beauties of nature are there because there is also a creator behind them and that creator is God? Well, all right, you could establish, but we're, the issue today is actually demigods. <coughs> how do we talk about the demigods? Recording in progress. This meeting is being recorded. All right, everyone's back. Hare Krishna. All right, so let's begin with group number one. Do we have a spokesman for group number one to tell us about how you're going to... Yes, Hare Krishna. So let's look at the question of group number one uh, here. 
the gentleman is concerned, criticizes Iskon for neglecting to worship the demigods. So, how are you going to respond? Group one? Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes, I'm the uh, spokesperson on behalf of group one. So, uh, we discussed some points on how to um, uh, respond to such a person. So, when we referred to the verses from 3.10 to 16, we uh, found out that uh, demigods, they are only empowered administrators who um, give us all of the uh, necessities that we require because they are authorized by the Supreme Lord and they are appointed officers under the Lord. And so the second point that we got was that when Lord Krishna is worshipped, the demigods who are the different limbs of the Lord, they are also automatically worshipped. And so therefore there is no separate need to worship the demigods. Like when we are watering a plant, we don't uh, water each individual leaf uh, on its own. We water the roots and automatically all the other leaves um, are satisfied and get the water. The next point that we got is that the Supreme Lord Krishna is the master of all the living entities and one of and the Vedas main aim is to understand the Lord. And so when Lord Vishnu who is uh, worshipped as the chief beneficiary, the Yagnapati is satisfied and so uh, all the aims of the other Yagnas are also satisfied in that way. So that is why um, they, now we are not neglecting the worship of the demigods, but it is automatically done when we worship the Supreme Lord, which is one of the main aims of this God. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Oh, okay. So you are saying that if we worship the Supreme Lord, we don't need to worship the demigods. <coughs> All right, let's hear yes. group two before we respond more. Can we hear group two, how you responded? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, yes, from group two, Rishikesh Goswami. Uh, Maharaj, <clears throat> same question, uh, a person at home program uh, asking us why we are neglecting the worship of demigods. In text 10, the very first sentence or line of the translation says, in the beginning of creation, the Lord of all creatures sent forth generations of men and demigods. So in the Sarga stage itself, the creation of demigod itself has been through the Lord. And <clears throat> 310 to 316 is a slow progression for those who are in the Karmakanda stage to slowly come to Karma Yoga stage. The <clears throat> there's a cycle of production, Anna Bhavati, Bhutani, etc. So the, the, the food is subsistence of the human beings are because of food. Food is produced from the from the rain, rain is produced from uh, yagyas, uh, yagyas are because of prescribed duties, prescribed duties from the Vedas, Vedas come, as you rightly said in, in, in one of the slides we, uh, before this class, he said, the Vedas come from, uh, text 15 says, the Vedas come from the Supreme Lord. Consequently, the all-pervading transcendence, which is the Supreme Lord, is eternally situated in acts of sacrifice. So if he is satisfied, then everything is satisfied, everyone is satisfied. We can go on to say Yathatarur Muli Sachinena, which is in Kanto 4, or even chapter 7, we say those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desire surrender onto the demigods. So the sum and substance is supreme is supreme. He produced the demigods, not the other way around. So if he's satisfied, everyone is satisfied. Hare Krishna. Oh, oh okay. Thank you very much. Very nice responses from both groups. Interesting to hear the different approaches, but very effective and very nice to hear in line with our philosophy why we're, in some ways it appears like we're neglecting to worship the demigods. At the same time, we do offer our respect to the demigods. We don't disrespect the demigods. We do offer our respects to them because we understand that they are uh, superiors. They are performing valuable service on behalf of the Lord. And therefore we do offer our respects to them. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was uh, travelling around India, he would go to the Shiva temples, he would go to the Durga temples, he would go and offer respects. So. We do offer our respects there, but we don't worship them as the Supreme. 
because we recognize their position as being uh, empowered representative, subordinate to the Supreme Lord. And we offer our worship to the Supreme Lord. All right, so we'll go ahead. Text number two, uh, the second question, dealing with the environment. A spiritual solution to our environmental challenges, the Vedic perspective. Group three, do you have yes, a spokesman? Yes. Yes, Mara Hare Krishna. Um, there are there are a lot of environmental issues, challenges which have been which have been faced, like famine, global warming, drought, and the solution for this through Vedic perspective can be said to verse number twelve of uh, the chapter third. Wherein Krishna, through demigods, provides all the natural resources, that is, all the food that we have, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, the rainfall, the moonlight, all these things, like, even if they have to manufacture, humans have to manufacture, then also they require resources from the nature, that is, metal, sulfur, mercury, and all this. These all, these all are not manufactured by us. They are provided to us through Krishna. And over... Uh, usage of these for our sense gratification leads to greed and because of that there are a lot of environmental issues if our lives are meant to use such resources only for our uh, spiritual growth that is for self realization for the purpose of self realization we must we, we, we should make proper use of them to keep ourselves fit and healthy for the purpose of self realization leading to the ultimate goal of life, that is, liberation from the material struggle of existence. So, in this way, if we, uh, the solution that he has given is uh, Yagya. And in today's uh, uh, Kali Yuga, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has provided this Yagya in a very easiest form, that is, uh, Harinam Sankirtan Yagya. So, if we, if we try to exploit and utilize those resources for our sense of gratification, we will, we will be like thieves who will be never happy in this world because we have not the knowledge of, uh, we are not interested in the knowledge of uh, Vedic and spiritual enlightenment and uh, are always into sense gratification. So in this way, uh, Prabhupada Ji also had uh, suggested his disciples when there was some uh, some drought in uh, Hyderabad area to go to go to that place and perform Harinam Sankirtan and it was very effective. And also in Fiji there was some Padhyatra that was that was been instructed by Prabhupada Ji uh, along with Sankirtan. So in this way environmental issues can be resolved by uh, self-realized souls. All right, thank you. <coughs> very uh thought-provoking challenge to the environment. That if we promote Sankirtan, Harinam Sankirtan, will solve all of our environmental challenges. I want everyone to chant Hare Krishna and benefit, ben the whole planet will benefit. All right, let's hear group number four. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, similar to what Mataji said, we refer to verses 11, 12, 13, 14 mainly. So, verse number 12 says, Bhagavad Gita verse 12, that air, light, water are provided by Mother Nature. Same way, uh, milk, food grains, vegetables, etc. are also provided by Mother Nature. So, basically, we don't have control over these things. These are not created by us or manufactured by us in a factory. So how are we going to control them if it is not in our control and uh, we are not manufacturing them? So it is provided by some supreme or say mother nature. So definitely it is coming from some other source. So what we have to do, uh, Bhagavad Gita recommends that by Yajna, all the demigods are uh, satisfied because demigods are uh, representatives and appointed by Supreme Lord to control water, uh, so uh, rain, uh, control air by um, different demigods, light, uh, which is sun, sun god. So all these are representatives and by doing yajna, we are satisfying them. So yajna is the solution since we don't have any much option 
because we are not controlling them and also yagna were different when uh, their time was old but in this age it is very difficult to uh, use so much uh, food grains and so many materials to do yagna again we are on shortage side so it is recommended in this age to do sankirtan yagna which is very easy very convenient and there is nothing to lose in trying it out so it is best uh, suggestion from spiritual point of view to do sankirtan yagna and it will definitely satisfy the supreme lord and in turn uh, to all the devatas and uh, so we will have uh, more uh, supplies and abundance uh, in every possible way okay okay very very nice thank you satisfy all the demigods by doing sankirtan the ultimate yagya for the kali yuga okay <laughs> so this is our solution to the environment and now the the final question dealing with these people who are claiming that man can produce all his necessities the, by intelligence and usual and use of natural resources man can produce all his necessities and demigods and all of these things this is just nonsense talk not no reality no truth in it so group number five we will hear first group five who's the spokesman Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. yes Hare Krishna Prabhu yeah uh, so we discuss few points and uh, try to quote them as per my relative connection so uh, Prabhupada gives the examples of machines which are uh, uh, man has created machines and then uh, God has created machines, such machines which can go on producing more machines without human intervention, which is like um, uh, the human body is like a machine and it can produce more machines. And then there is an example of trees which regenerate themselves. The, the complete tree is present within a seed and it can produce like unlimited amount of trees in that. And then uh, one point was that after the human intervention, the global warming and the degradation of crops has happened. After the, there's so much damage has been done to the environment and to the mountains. And uh, so, so due to all of this has happened because of the human intervention. But Prabhupada used to tell that uh, in the olden times, the oceans would be present full of gems and uh, naturally occurring resources would be uh, very valuable resources would be also available in nature in abundance like mountains would used to have gold then another point was that the recycling uh, is a very natural process like like respiration humans give out uh, humans and animals give out carbon dioxide and plants release oxygen so like it is completely re natural recycling there is no human intervention in this. Then, uh, for the example that uh, you, the grains, they cannot be produced in, in factory. So, someone who says that uh, natural resources can be, uh, man can do all of this. So, grains cannot be produced in a factory. So, grains can only be, you know, uh, produced via agriculture. So, men are basically just using raw materials and uh, uh, inventing things but whatever uh, god has given us uh, that is there is a superior intelligence behind this so yeah, those were few points that i i could recollect okay Prabhu, thank you thank you very much yes a lot of signs there that they're claiming man can produce all his necessities but man is very much dependent on nature to produce anything they say man can produce all, what, but what can he produce? The, uh, the, as Prabhupada used to say, where do the chemicals come from in the beginning? They say life comes from chemicals, and Prabhupada would say, well, where do the chemicals come from? So here they're talking about use of natural resources, that can produce, but where do these come from? So we should understand there is some intelligence behind the universe. Yes, let's hear group six. Hare Krishna Maharaj. 
So the question says, in our modern technological society, so let us see what is the uh, you know aim of modern technical technological society. The gross materialistic thieves have no ultimate goal of life. They are simply directed towards sense gratification. This is the first thing. Why modern technology is not able to understand what the reality is. And the next two things, intelligence and use of natural resources. First of all, intelligence. Whatever we do, we are doing today, we are doing it because of intelligence. And in chapter 7 and verse 10, the Lord says, Buddhir buddhi matam asmi. That he is the source of that intelligence which man is claiming to be his own and using and saying that we don't need demigod, we don't need God, we don't need anybody else. So that's why the modern technological men are not uh, you know, knowing this or they are ignoring the fact. And the next thing is the use of natural resources. So they can produce things as, uh, you know, very correctly Mukesh Prabhu said that they can manufacture things in the factory, but where is the raw material coming from? like you know the sunlight air fire water soil all of these things what is the source what they from what from where they are coming from so they are ignoring the fact that these things are not under their control they cannot manufacture even they say that we go non-vegetarians and we are eating animals see animals are eating something no animals are eating plants and plants they're growing in soil and again you don't have any control over soil or the environmental conditions or anything else. So how can you say that you are controlling and you don't need anybody else, you don't need demigods to be giving you anything. So if we need to produce something in the fields, then we would, uh, you know, need demigods and we would have to do, uh, you know, yagna also to get the rains. So this is the thing which we got and it is mentioned in the verse 14 that ultimately we have to depend on the production of the field and not on the production of big factories. So for the things, the raw material, which is coming from the fields, we would have to be depending upon the demigods. It is not under our control. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Very powerful. <laughs> You're a very powerful speaker. Very, very nice to hear. Yes, I like this point about uh, all living entities living on grains and grains are born by, to get grains you have to have rain and rain comes by sacrifice. And as the other group said, you know, we heard before in another group they were talking that uh, well, there was a drought in Andhra Pradesh one year and the devotees went there and did Sankirtan and the rain came. And so actually the real solution to make sure there's proper rainfall, we have to do more Sankirtan. Then we often find out when we, when we have nice Sankirtan, we get good rain. And so the rain, the, the, the Sankirtan is the yagya, which ensures the cooperation of nature. So this is an important point. And we do yagya. Indicates there are some beings there, they're controllers of these things. Just like there's some areas where there's no light. There's some areas that they have, they practically, they have six months of darkness and then six months of light. And so these areas are very demoniac. If you study, if you go to these places, you can see how people live, how they, they, they become very demoniac because it, it's so artificial. And some parts of the planet are very cold. There's no heat, it's, so, it's just so cold, it's so freezing. And people are living in this very cold climate. So it's very depressing and miserable for them. But where you worship the demigods, then you see there's proper light and heat and rain. Everything is provided. And these demigods are, they're like the, the administrators under the Supreme Lord. Just like in a government, there's one supreme governor, and below that he has his different ministers. So the supreme lord, he has also his hierarchy, and they are the demigods. So when people say they don't believe in demigods, they don't believe in God either. They're actually atheists, so they're rascals. Right? We want to expose these people. It's just rascaldom to say there's no God in control. 
So we're, we're preaching about God. We're, we want to challenge these people and prove to them actually there is God. Okay, so thank you all very much for your very nice participation in this exercise. We'll go ahead. Prahlad Prabhu, would you like to read this for me, please? Yes, Maharaj. This is a cycle. We are living on food grains. Greens, vegetables, they are actually our food. Now I am living and getting energy by eating grains and vegetables. And how my energy should be utilized? It should be utilized for the purpose from where I am getting the from where I am getting energy. I am getting energy from the Supreme Lord by supply of this food stuff. Therefore, my energy should be utilized for the service of the Supreme Lord. Bhagavad Gita, chapter three, text eleven to nineteen, Los Angeles, December 27, 1968. All right. So, what's the cycle? What cycle is this Prabhupada is talking about? Can you explain, Prahlad? This is the cycle of, um, uh, it's basically how we live, Maharaj. So we are dependent on, we're always dependent on nature. We're living off grains and uh, these grains come from rain and also, we are very dependent. Yeah, so what, what is the cycle? Not sure, Maharaj. The cycle. Well, Prabhupada was, well, it was there in the Bhagavad Gita in that section also. All living entities subsist on food grains, and Prabhupada's mentioning that. We're all living on food grains. And where do the food grains come from? The food grains come because we, when we get rain, you can't produce grains without rain. There has to be rain in order to get grains. And to get rain, there has to be yagya. And when there's yag when we do yagya, then you get the, the, the grains. So the energy, we're eating grains, we get energy. And that energy is actually meant for the service of Krishna. Where do we get the energy from? We get energy from eating the grains. But where do the grains come from? The grains are given by the Supreme Lord, the supply of the foodstuff. So that energy which we have, it comes from the Lord. So it should be used for the service of the Lord. Right? If you don't eat, you don't have any energy. So we eat, we eat grains, we get energy, and we work. But who gives that grain? The grains are coming from the Supreme Lord, by the grace of the Lord. So that energy is meant to be used for the service of the Lord. This is the cycle. All right. Now we're going to go look at the yoga ladder. Right? A yogi is greater than the ascetic, greater than the empiricist, and greater than the fruit of worker. Therefore, O Arjuna, in all circumstances, be a yogi. That's text number 46 of chapter 6. A yogi is greater. Which yogi is that? This, of course, is referring to the bhakti yogi. The yogi is greater than the ascetic, greater than the empiricist, and greater than the fruit of worker. So, the karmi, the empiricist means the jnani and the ascetic, the vairagi or tapasvi. But greater still is a yogi. Yes? Can someone read this one? It may be Can I read? Yes, please. It may be compared to a ladder for attaining the topmost spiritual realization. This ladder begins from the lowest material condition of living entity and rises up to perfect self-realization in pure spiritual life. According to the various elevations, different parts of the ladder are known by different names, but all in all, the complete ladder is called yoga. Purpose 6.3. Okay. 
So we're hearing about the yoga ladder, different elevations, different positions. Yes? We need someone to read? Gradual progress. Yes, the gradual progress of yoga system. Karma yoga to Gnana yoga. Karma yoga means fruit of activities, bias activities or prescribed activities. Then by performing karma yoga, one comes to platform of Gnana yoga, knowledge. And from knowledge to the Sastanga yoga. Then from Ashtanga Yoga, concentrating the mind on Vishnu, come to the point of Bhakti Yoga. Bhagavad Gita 6.46-47, Los Angeles, February 21st, 1969. Okay, thank you. Gradual process through the different yogas. Right? At the, at the bottom we have the Karma Yogi, then above the Karma Yogi is the Jnana Yogi. And above the Jnana Yogi, you have the Dhyana Yogi, they are the Astanga Yogi. And above that, the Bhakti Yogi. Here's the Yoga Ladder. Alright, here's Bhakti Yoga. Now you notice there's the Brahman and Paramatma. Now some Yogis, they're interested to go to the Brahman. And some yogis, they're focused on the Paramatma. And here at the bottom, you have the Karma Kandi. The Karma Kandi, he just wants to enjoy the material world. Though he's not really a devotee, he's not really on the yoga ladder. He's a Karma Kandi. He's just performing acts for his own benefit. All right, so it goes on. He may be gradually, he may come to karma yoga. With good association, he may be brought to something higher. From karma kanda, he may come to karma yoga. If he gets the right instruction, the right association, then it can help him to come up to karma yoga. You know, he may give a donation for the temple or something. Because he's a karma kandi, so he's inclined to do charity, he's inclined to get some benefit, likes to do help for others, things that will help him, and so he gets the association of a devotee. And somebody may preach to him and instruct him about karma yoga. Now karma yogis, sometimes they just want to go to the Brahman. They're just interested in impersonal liberation. They just want to get free from the material world. And so they, and they just simply go to the Brahman. Oh. Okay. Now other karma yogis, they may go on and become jnana yogis. They come up to the platform of knowledge and become jnana yogis. So, they get, you know, general, generally karma yogi doesn't know much, he doesn't have much knowledge, but somehow because he's doing uh, pious activities, he's performing his duty nicely, he gets good association and he gets some knowledge and he comes up to the platform of jnana yoga. And from the platform of jnana yoga, again, he may be attracted simply to go to the Brahman. He's interested in the, achieving the impersonal liberation. The impersonal liberation is easier for people to appreciate than the divine nature of the spiritual world. Not everyone is ready to accept the nature of the spiritual world and the Lord with his different shaktis and planets and everything. And so some people, they simply think of the oneness, the, the, the nature of the Brahma Jyoti, Sayuja Mukti, impersonal liberation. So Jnana Yogis, they like to often go there, but other Jnana Yogis, with the knowledge they get, they may take up meditation and they start to do Dhyana Yoga. They're meditating 
and they will realize, of course, when they're meditating, some of them, not all, will meditate on the Paramatma, the Super Soul, the Lord in the heart. And from the Paramatma, they can go on and come to Bhakti Yoga. All right, so there, there are links between the different yoga systems. Here, we've listed some of the different connections here, different verses. Let's see. Can we have someone read for us, please? Uh, just the, the translation of the verse, chapter 2, text 31. Yes, yes Yes, chapter 2, text 31. Translation by Maharaj. Yes. Chapter 2, text 31. Considering your specific duty as a Kshatriya, you should know that there is no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles, and so there is no need for hesitation. Okay, so fighting on religious principles. So this is coming to karma yoga, the, the idea of doing the duty, but according to religious principles, becomes karma yoga. All right, and then 311, what does it say? 311, the demigods being pleased by sacrifices will also please you, and thus by cooperation between men and demigods, prosperity will regime all, for all. All right, and then 316. Thus, certainly leads a life full of sin. Living only for the satisfaction of senses, such a person lives in pain. All right. So we've cited these three different verses as a a guide to us to bring how the person comes from karma kanda, how he can come to the higher level to karma yoga. And then here we some some verses which describe how from karma yoga we can come to jnana yoga. Beginning with chapter five, text number two. Can someone read? Maharaj, I have a question yes. on the previous one. Yes. Yeah. So in 3.11 it said about, uh, you know, sacrifice and pleasing the demigods. So it's more of karma kanda, right? It's just because it is Krishna saying is it becomes karma yoga? Or? Yes, it's more of karma kanda because the demigods are there. But ultimately we understand, you know, that the, the demigods are, you know, they're, they're, they're not the supreme. That there's ultimately, there's higher... There's a supreme over everyone. The demigods, they're giving results which are limited and temporary. And so the thoughtful person will want to get some be more eternal benefit. And you think how to, get, how to get some eternal benefit. Worshipping the demigods, we're getting material benefit, but that's only temporary. How can we get eternal benefit? That will bring him to karma yoga. No. when he begins to contemplate how to get something higher rather than just the temporary benefits of the material world. It's not a question, you don't want to really bring in Krishna at this point, it's not there. But it's the karma yogi is just somebody who wants to work in a detached manner. He's sacrificing the results. The question is, who is he sacrificing the results for? Now in Karma Kanda is sacrificing the results for his own benefit. But as he thinks about it, he will go on to understand that the benefit I'm getting is just temporary. How can I get eternal benefit? How can I get greater benefit? And so then he will learn about Karma Yoga. This, if he works for the Supreme, in a detached manner, then he will get the benefit. 
So okay, this, this is the idea. Yes? And then we speak about karma yoga, how it becomes jnana yoga. Chapter 5, text 2, someone read. The personality of Godhead replies, the renunciation of work and work in devotion. Both are good for liberation, but of the two, work in devotional service is better than renunciation of work. Okay. Work in devotional service is better than renunciation of work. Renunciation what? of work, that was karma sannyas, you see. But work in devotion, that is actually, that is close to karma yoga. Karma Thank yoga you. is coming close to that. But What's... with knowledge, with the knowledge, then it becomes jnana yoga. Not just simply karma yoga, but yeah, actually understand something higher. And the knowledge is there, you see, and that knowledge is, that's it, the, the key factor. We actually come to understand there's something better. Karma yogi is just working detached, giving the results. But jnana yoga is actually knows why he's detaching and who he's giving the results to. Yes, and six, six, chapter 6, text 46, 47. A yogi is greater than the aesthetic greater, than the empiricist, and greater than the fruitative worker. Therefore, O Arjuna, in all circumstances, be a yogi. Jai. <laughs> be a yogi. And of all yogis, the one with great faith, who always abides in me, thinks of me, within himself and renders transcendental loving service to me, he is the most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. That is my opinion. All right. So those two verses are cited again, bringing us from jnana yoga to dhyana yoga. And then here we have dhyana yoga, where it becomes bhakti yoga. Chapter 6, text 30, 31. Can someone read? Yeah, Maharaj, for one who sees me everywhere and sees in me, see everything in me, I am not lost, nor is he ever lost to me. All right, very nice verse, yes. For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost to him, nor is he ever lost to me. So that's bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga begins with meditation on the Lord, dhyana yoga. And dhyana yoga leads to bhakti yoga, meditating on the Lord. You see the Lord and then you're never lost to the Lord. Karma yoga to jnana yoga, 5.2, we just read it. Activities performed in full knowledge. Strengthen one's advancement in real knowledge. All right? If, you, if we know why we're doing something, that's important. If you just do it without knowing, you get some benefit, but you get more benefit if you actually know why you're doing it. So our advancement in real knowledge comes about when we perform the activities in knowledge. When karma yoga increases in knowledge and renunciation, the stage is called jnana yoga. So increasing in knowledge and renunciation, then karma yoga comes jnana yoga. There's karma yoga, not much knowledge, and maybe even not much renunciation. But as the renunciation increases, the knowledge increases, then it becomes jnana yoga. And when jnana yoga increases in meditation on the super soul by different physical processes and the mind is on him, it is called astanga yoga. So the mind is on him. Jnana yoga increases in meditation. Jnana yoga is just the knowledge, but when we start to meditate more, 
then it becomes dhyana yoga. And finally, dhyana yoga to bhakti yoga, sarva bhuta stitam yomam bhajati ekatvam astita. Such a yogi engages in the worshipful service of the super soul, knowing that I and the super soul are one. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 6, text 31. So, understanding the super soul is the Lord, they will engage in the devotional service. He engages in the service of the super soul. That is bhakti yoga. So, from dhyana yoga comes to bhakti yoga. Such a yogi turns into a pure devotee, cannot bear to live for a moment without seeing the Lord within himself. Chapter 6, text 30, purport. All right, so here's our yoga ladder again. You can see karma kanda to karma yoga to jnana yoga, dhyana yoga. Jnana yogis meditating on the paramatma and realize the paramatma, then he goes on to take up bhakti yoga. But some other people, like sometimes the karma yogi, he will go to the Brahman. Sometimes the jnana yogi will also go to the Brahman. You see? They don't always follow the yoga ladder. Some, jnana, some karma yogis will go on to jnana yoga and jnana yoga, and other karma yogis will just go to the Brahman. They'll be attracted to the impersonal Brahma Jyoti. So, we should understand that. Same yukta tamomata, bhakti is the highest of all. Bhagavad Gita 6.47. All right? Oh. So, we presented an overview of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4 and 5. Oh, actually, that's, that's coming. It's in the next lesson. That's not there. Maharaj, can we ask a question? Yeah, yes. 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 Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, we, we, we talked about, if we can bring the slide, please, for the uh, yoga ladder, please. We mentioned Karma Yoga, Karma Khan to Karma Yoga to Gyan, Gyan Yoga. Now, when it comes to Gyan Yoga, I, I'm still confused about what exactly are, is the Gyana we are talking about. Because there are two different references that I see of Gyana. One is, Jnana means Sankhya, means I am soul and body are different, body is made of the five elements, so that's also Jnana. A soul is separate from the body, that's one kind of Jnana. The second Jnana, which seems to be relevant here is, because we are talking of Karma Yoga, it, the Jnana of prescribed duties. What are my prescribed duties? So, in this case, in this yoga ladder, from Karma Yoga to Jnana Yoga, in Jnana Yoga, which Jnana are we talking about? We're talking about the knowledge of the soul. The difference. We're not talking about. Sorry. The difference sorry. between the body and the soul. We're not talking about prescribed duty. Okay, so so Jnana Yoga means here uh, it's a Sankhya Yoga basically. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Jnana Yoga, yeah. We have to distinguish between the body and the soul, and we, not, not all jnanis will be able to distinguish between the soul and the super soul. Those who cannot distinguish between the soul and the super soul, they will be attracted to the Brahman. Where other jnanis who can distinguish between the soul and the super soul, they will go on to dhyana yoga and realize the Paramatma. So that would be different knowledge, different kinds of gyan. All right. Thank you, Maharaj. That's more clarifying now. Thank you. Yes. Can we ask a question? Yes, Prabhu, go ahead. Maharaj, what triggers a Ashtanga Yogi to take to Bhakti Yoga? Ashtanga Yogi, what inspires him to take to Bhakti Yoga? Well, well, again, Astanga Yogi, he realizes there's a Supreme Lord and he is the servant of the Supreme Lord. So in his meditation on the Super Soul, 
he realizes that he is a tiny living entity who is related to the Paramatma in the sense that he is a servant and the Paramatma is the master. So in this way he will come, he will want to take up devotional service. Okay. He realizes his, his position as being subordinate to the super soul. Now if the yogi thinks, I am the super soul, then you go to the Brahman. Right? He's not able to distinguish between the, the Jivatma and the Paramatma. He'll go to the Brahman. But one who is realizing the difference between the Paramatma and the Jivatma, and that the Paramatma is the overseer and the master, and the Jivatma is the servant, then he will want to take up devotional service and he will begin the activities of bhakti yoga. Beginning Maharaj, with, yes? Maharaj, one more question. Does the karma yogi and the jnana yogi who merge into the Brahman, does it have a permanent effect? Does that jnana have permanent effect? No, karma uh, yogi and the uh, Jnani, uh, they, if they merge into the Brahman effulgence, uh, the effect is permanent? Well, not usually. We, we do say that you enter into the Brahma Jyoti, they, they again come back. They often fall back to the material world. Arora Krishrena Parampatam Tada Patanti Addo Nadreta Yasmad Angraya because their intelligence is not properly purified. So they have entered into the Brahma Jyoti. And into the Brahma Jyoti, there's no activity there. There's no variety there. There's no relationships there. And so after some time, they often become bored there and they come back to the material world. And then they may begin welfare activities or something, or they may, they may be fortunate when they're in the Brahman, they may be fortunate, they may get association with devotees. Somehow, maybe a Sankirtan party is passing through the Brahman and they're attracted. You know, sometimes it happens that the Sankirtan party, the devotees are passing through the Brahma Jyoti and the impersonalists who are in the Brahma Jyoti, they hear the chanting of the holy names and they're attracted. So they may leave the Brahman and that way join the devotees and go to the, into the spiritual planets. But often they come back, they come back to the material world. You understand, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I ask one question? Yes. Um, there are so many examples in Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, like Vidura, uh, he was a devotee although, but he left his body in Dhyan Yoga uh, by meditating on uh, Supreme Lord, but uh, on Paramatma form. And even uh, Bhishma Pitama, he wanted to see Krishna in four-handed form. So that is also kind of uh, Dhyan Yoga, although he was a devotee. And uh, Krishna himself was present in two-handed form. So I'm getting confused, uh, like how Dhyan Yoga, how we can explain this, Maharaj? Well, uh, Vidura, remember Vidura's Yamaraj. So when he left the body, you know, he, pro you know, he was going, probably going back to his position as Yamaraj to take over, take back his duty again. He was cursed for some time. And so he had, you know, however, I, I, I'm not familiar with the details. I don't know where you read this. Where did you read about Vidura leaving the body? I, th uh, I think he went to the jungle and he meditated on Lord in Dhyan Yoga, something I have read in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Meditated in Jnana Yoga? Jnana Yoga? Dhyan, Dhyan. Dhyan. Yes, well, meditation on, 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 the, on the Lord, yeah. Give up his body, meditating on the Lord. But so that, it was not Bhakti Yoga, although he was a devotee. Like, I just want to... Well, the forearm form simply means Vaikuntha. 
right? Meditating on the Lord with the forearm form is this Vaikuntha form. So entering into the spiritual, just like Bhishma, Bhishma meditates on the Lord as uh, Partha Sarati, as the charioteer, chariot driver of Arjuna. And so Bhishma also goes to the planet, it's also a Vaikuntha planet where the Lord is there. It's this Vasudev form. I don't think it's so bad. And certainly they're devotees. And devotees also go to Vaikuntha, you know. Not every devotee goes to Goloka. Oh, okay, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh-huh. So, Maharaj. I wanted to uh, see Lord in uh, Paramatma form. I mean, to just ask that. Although they were knowing that Krishna in two-handed form is Supreme Lord, but still they wanted to go through the process of Dhyana Yoga in Paramatma, merging in like uh, Vishnu, Vishnu Loka, Vakuntha. Well, it depends a lot on the rasa with Krishna, remember. The rasa in Vaikuntha is going to be more servitude, dasa rasa. So they, they, their relationship with Krishna is more on that level. And so they enter to the Vaikuntha planets. Yes, Maharaj, now it is clarified. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, uh, is it possible uh, to go to Bhakti Yoga directly from Karmakanda to, or from any other ladder directly go to Bhakti? Is it, is it possible? Or is yes, it possible? definitely. Our whole Krishna conscious program, we go directly to Bhakti Yoga. We don't do anything else. We just simply go in the elevator. We go in the elevator, we go straight to Bhakti Yoga. We, go, we don't go through the yoga ladder. Yeah, we'll be explaining that in the next class, that we go directly to Bhakti Yoga. We don't go through all of these different levels, but Bhakti, Bhakti Yoga includes all of these stages. The Bhakti Yoga level, within the practice of Bhakti Yoga, all of these other systems are there. Okay, thank you. Para? Para? Yes. Maharaj, when Krishna uh, sometimes kills the demons, uh, they also sometimes uh, merge in the body of Krishna. Is it the same like the jnanis also merge with the Brahman? Mm, yeah, like that. Yeah, the, the, we, we often say that, that the demons and the jnanis, they get the same destination, merging into the Brahma Jyoti. The demons killed by Krishna enter into the Brahma Jyoti and they, the big jnanis cultivating the imper knowledge of the impersonal Brahman, they go to the same place where the demons go. Maharaj, and also how to understand the statement by Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur that uh, merging in the Brahman has a permanent effect? How to understand that? Uh, I, I don't know. Where, where is that statement? Where? It's the commentary by uh, Vishwatha Chakravarti. Where? Where, where uh, in his commentary? I will quote the reference later, Maharaj. Uh, not uh, ready made now. <laughs> no, okay, I, I'm not familiar. I haven't noticed that statement anywhere. If you find it to me, please send me the details. Let me look through. Yes. Yeah? Maharaj, in text number 31, uh, Bhakti Yoga is defined, where it is said that. Uh, such a yogi who engages in the worshipful service of super soul, knowing that I and the super soul are one. So I and the super soul are one is more appropriate or I and the, uh, I am a subservient of the super soul should be more appropriate or is it fine? Because this, this is confusing like it is making it relate to some impersonal uh, form of Brahman. What, the super soul? Impersonal form? No, super soul is very personal. Super soul is very? The super soul is personal. It's not impersonal. The super soul is personal. The, so some people do meditate on the Lord as the super soul, and the, the Lord in the heart. Yes, meditation. On the, just like we see here, Paramatma, and then it leads to Bhakti Yoga. And you say, I and the super soul are one, one in interest. 
We keep our okay. individuality, but oneness in interest. Okay, fine. Yes, just like in the family, I and my father are one. We have the interest of the family at heart. And so the same way the yogi and the paramatma are one in interest. The yogi's interest what is... The... Yeah? Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu had a question? I have one, Maharaj. Okay. Um, you think there was a... No, karma yoga is detached work. And jnana yoga, why detaching? Can you explain a little bit on that? Like, if we are working um, and we are detached to work, then we are following karma yoga? Or um, when we are attached to work, that's jnana yoga. When we're attached to work, uh, well, we said karma yoga is working, we're attached to working in a particular way, but in karma yoga, we're detached from the result. We give the results, right? We sacrifice the result of the work. But with karma yoga, there's an attachment to duty, and that we work in a particular way. So in that sense, there's an atta attachment to work, but detachment to the result. And jnana yoga, in jnana yoga, there's an increase in renunciation and knowledge. Increase in renunciation in the sense that the, he's not so much concerned with working anymore. Because he's come to a higher level of consciousness, so he's less inclined to work. He's understood his identity as a spiritual soul. And he's not thinking that, you know, I'm a, I'm a Brahmana or I'm a Kshatriya or anything. He has no duty to perform. So Jnana Yogi tends to stop working. And they're more inclined to study and to contemplate the nature of the Absolute Truth. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions here? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, just uh, another one, please. Yeah, go uh, ahead. From the discussion. Uh, Maharaj, uh, I'm, I'm just looking at Dhyani Yogi, and uh, we mentioned Dhyani Yogi going to uh, having a Paramatma realization and then to Bhakti Yoga, uh, 630 and 631. My, somewhere in my previous notes, when I was doing a research on these verses, it seems that Dhyan Yogi can also go to Brahman platform or, 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 or Brahma Jyoti. Yes. And some, some can go to Vaikuntha, i.e. through Paramatma feature and then to Bhakti Yoga. The difference being that if the Dhyan Yogi, when he looks at Paramatma inside him on meditation and thinks, this is me, <laughs> then that yogi gets Sayujya Mukti and therefore he goes to Brahma Jyoti. Right. But if he thinks, oh, what is this beautiful person? I want to serve him. With that attitude, he goes to the Vaikuntha Loka, but only in Shantarasa. I do not know the, the technicalities behind it, but that's what I had learned somewhere. Okay. Can you please ex uh, tell us if this is right and why Shantarasa only? Yes, it's right. Uh, why Shantarasa only? It doesn't have to be Shantarasa only. But the way you described it, if he sees the Paramatma and he thinks, oh, how, you know, he's attracted by the beauty and everything, but he doesn't engage in any service. If he's not taking up any service, then it will just be Shantaras. It will just be that level of Shantaras because he's not, under, he's not taken up any actual service for the Lord. So that's a Maharaj, flute or a feather in Krishna's helmet, these are Shantaras. Aren't they performing? Is flute not performing a service? Well, not on its own. Krishna has to pick up the flute and play it, right? Right, right. Thanks. Thanks, Maharaj. 
the, the flute is something inanimate, right? Uh, we, could, well, we could say it has consciousness, but the flute's not going to actually play itself. It's only when Krishna picks up the flute, he blows through it. And so it's Shant Shantaras. Though Shantaras is appreciating the opulences of Krishna, appreciating the beauty of Krishna, but not engaging in any service. So that is Shantaras. And the examples of devotees, we have like the four Kumaras and the nine Yugendras, they're said to be in Shantaras. Now Shantaras is also, you know, they're, they're great devotees. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, they're in the spiritual world also. Okay. Any other questions? We do. Yes, 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 go ahead, Maharaji. Regarding this uh, uh, units that we have covered, next week we have our uh, uh, close book assessment. Uh, and uh, um, is there any chapters to the left, Maharaj? But is he saying next week he wants to give close book assessment? Yes, Maharaj. Well, I have to talk to him and see if we can extend it a little longer. And we could go over some more things. Maharaj, actually, uh, today you told Unit 2, Maharaj, but it, here uh, we have this also in Unit 1, Maharaj. <laughs> yeah. Till Chapter 6. Yeah, I know, Chapter 6. The whole thing is actually for six chapters. It's really all Unit 1. We just broke the Unit 1 into two sections. Anyway, I'll talk to him and find out. Is that Ojasvi Prabhu who's arranging? Yes, yes Maharaj. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll talk with him. Okay, Maharaj, thank you. We'll try to get some extensions to do a bit more. Okay, anyway, the overview of chapters 4 and 5, we didn't show it here, but you do have it in your student handbook, the, uh, the overview is given. We've looked at the progression, and we pointed out different verses also, and we saw the diagram of the yoga ladder showing the links from karma yoga to bhakti yoga. The authorized process of demigod worship and yagya with reference to Bhagavad Gita. Now, there's nothing wrong to worship the demigods. If we worship the demigods as being a part of the body of the Supreme Lord, that can be done. And there were some great devotees who worshipped demigods, considering them to be part of the Supreme Lord. Even we have the example of Sanatana Goswami. He was very, a very great devotee of Lord Shiva. Of course, he knew Lord Shiva is not the Supreme Lord, but he was very fond of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva, of course, is one of the demigods and, and parts of the body of the Supreme Lord. A quote from Srila Prabhupada, Bhakti Yoga is the ultimate goal. The culmination of all kinds of yoga practices lies in Bhakti Yoga. All other yogas are but means to come to the point of Bhakti in Bhakti Yoga. Yoga actually means Bhakti Yoga. All other yogas are progressions towards the destination of Bhakti Yoga. Factually, Bhakti Yoga is the ultimate goal. But to analyze Bhakti Yoga minutely, one has to understand these other yogas. From the purport, text number 47, chapter 6. All right. We, let, we started a little late. Let's just go over some more things here. Uh, let me see if I can open up.
Are you able to see the PowerPoint? No? No, no Are you able to see it now? Yes, Marty. Yes. Okay. Yes, Maddox. Okay, good. Right. So we'll just go through this quickly. Right? This was what we covered, of course. We just covered this lesson two. Just we're going to look at lesson three, Bhakti, the ultimate yoga system. So here's the breakdown of chapter four. I think this is all in your student handbooks, right? You have the breakdown of chapter four? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, and chapter five. Okay, so transcendental knowledge is described here. Transcendental knowledge, jnana yoga. Transcendental knowledge, the spiritual knowledge of the soul, of God. And their relationship is both purifying and liberating. Such knowledge is the fruit of selfless devotional action, which is actually karma yoga. So the fruit of karma yoga is jnana, knowledge. The Lord explains the remote history of the Gita, the purpose and significance of his periodic descents to the material world, and the necessity of approaching a guru, a realized teacher. From the content, from the introduction, Bhagavad Gita as it is, contents. Okay, oh, sorry. Chapter four, chapter five. The breakdown of the chapter here. And chapter five, Karma Yoga. Action in Krishna Consciousness, subtitled Karma Sanyash Yoga. Outwardly performing all actions, but inwardly renouncing their fruits, the wise man, purified by the fire of transcendental knowledge, attains peace, detachment, forbearance, spiritual vision, and bliss. So this is karma yoga action in Krishna consciousness. So chapter 4 was describing karma yoga and sacrificing the results in knowledge. Chapter 5, however, is a description of the jnani, the one who has actually got the knowledge. In chapter 4, it's karma yoga and he's getting the knowledge as a result. And then chapter 5 goes on to describe the jnani, how he actually works, how he sees. And then chapter 6, you can see the breakdown here. It's all there in your student handbook. We won't go into it today. Uh, but just to show you, here is the breakdown of the Astanga Yoga. Then at the bottom you have Yoga Rurukshur and then you have the different limbs of the Astanga Yogi Yam, Niyama, San, Pranayam, Pratyahara, Dharana then Yoga Rudashya and then Dhyana and Samadhi. So these are different levels of the Astanga Yogi cultivating his meditation and concentration. At the stage of Yoga Rurukshur, he's working, he's active. But when you come to Yoga Rudashya, then there's inactivity, there's stopping activity and just contemplating within meditation, internal absorption. The, the soul can be the friend and it can also be 
or rather the mind can be the friend, it can also be the enemy. So those two terms are used there in the sixth chapter, Bandur and Shatru. And Karanam Banda Mokshaya, the cause of bondage or liberation. Right? For one who has conquered the mind, the mind is a friend. And for one who has failed to do so, his very mind is the greatest enemy. So mind is the central point of yoga practice. That's from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 6, text number 6. The mind is the central point of yoga practice. Prabhupada explains, the purpose of practicing Eightfold Yoga is to control the mind in order to make it a friend in discharging the human mission. The constitutional position of the living entity is to carry out the order of the superior. As long as one's mind remains an unconquered enemy, one has to serve the dictations of lust, anger, avarice, illusion, etc. But when the mind is conquered, one voluntarily agrees to abide by the dictation of the Personality of Godhead. For one who, is, for one who takes to Krishna Consciousness directly, perfect surrender to the dictation of the Lord follows automatically. This is from the Purport, Chapter 6, Text Number 6. We have to conquer the mind. The way how to conquer the mind? We take to Krishna Consciousness directly. Directly we take up Krishna Conscious activities. We engage in Bhakti Yoga. And th this way we surrender to Krishna. We take direction from Krishna. We abide by the direction of the Personality of Godhead. Now for Arjuna, Krishna was there directly. For us, we take shelter of the spiritual teacher and he guides us, he directs us. Mind is the driver. If you ask the driver, please get me into Krishna conscious temple, the driver will bring you here. And if you ask your driver, Please get me to that liquor house. The driver will drive you there. The driver's business is to drive you wherever you like. Similarly, your mind is the driver. If you lose control, then wherever he likes, he will take you. Then you're gone. Then your driver is your enemy. But if your driver acts on your order, then he's your friend. I think it should be quite clear. This is from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 6, verses 2 to 5. Everyone's okay with this? We're hearing about the relationship between the senses, the mind and the intelligence. We, there's, we, we, do, we do plan to do little exercises on this point that you can just quickly reply. Uh, if you look over 633 and 34, how practical is Astanga Yoga for the modern age? Right? Can you just read through quickly, 33 and 34? And tell me, how practical do you think this Astanga Yoga is for the modern age? Here you can see some of the points. What you have to do to practice Astanga Yoga. Ekaki, you have to go alone. You don't do it, you don't go with somebody else. You go alone. 
And where do you go? You don't go in the city. You don't sit inside your apartment. You know, people tell me sometimes, oh, I close the curtains and I sit down in my room. That's no good. That's not Astanga Yoga. You have to go Sucho Desh A, not in the city. You have to go outside to a remote place. And you have to take kusha grass with you. Chaila jina kusho taram, kusho grass, kusha grass. That's for sitting on. And of course you have a deer skin and cloth and you put the cloth over the deer skin. The deer skin will keep away the snakes and the wild animals. They'll smell the, there's a particular aroma coming from the deer skin which will keep the animals and snakes away. And then, dharana achalam stira, you have to sit perfectly still, devoid of fear. Even you're in this remote place and it's dark of night, you shouldn't be afraid. You have to practice brahmachari, strict celibacy, a lot, for a long time, not just for a weekend, for a long time. And then, unagitated. You should be unagitated, concentrate on Krishna and stop material existence. So how many of us could do all of these things? Very difficult. Yukta have to be regulated. Very difficult to actually do all these things. So for the Kali Yuga, practically this system is not possible. Being in constant touch with the Supreme, he attains the highest happiness. Bhagavad Gita 6.28. This is Astanga Yoga. So Prabhupada explains, just imagine what is his qualification. He is direct friend of Krishna and he is a great warrior. He has got administrative capacity and at the same time has knowledge. Comparing his knowledge, this Bhagavad Gita he understood within one hour. This Bhagavad Gita which is not understood in one life at the present moment. He understood this Bhagavad Gita in one hour. So how much intelligent he was and he belonged to the royal family. All facilities were there. So of course Prabhupada is talking about Arjuna and he's describing Arjuna's qualification. And Prabhupada continues, he is accepting that it is not possible for me. Do you think what was impossible for Arjuna 5,000 years before, in such favourable circumstances, is it possible for you? Do you belong to the Arjuna category? No, we are thousand times lower than Arjuna's category. And what was impossible for Arjuna, do you think it is possible for you? Well, if you do, then you're really off. <laughs> right? If we think it's possible for us, it's really ridiculous. So you can see all the different points which are really challenging for any normal person. Okay, so there's our yoga ladder. You can see the Jnana Yogi going to the Brahman. Okay, we discussed all that. So Bhakti Yoga contains all the components of the other yoga systems. By Karma Yoga, what's the important qualification there in Karma Yoga? Detachment. The Karma Yogi has to be detached from the results. He does his work, but he's detached from the result. Is a Bhakti Yogi attached? Bhakti yogi should also be detached. You must also be detached. You cannot be attached. We are attached to Krishna. 
We're detached to the result, detached from the results, but we're attached to Krishna. Then jnana yoga, knowledge. Do we have knowledge? Yes. We know about Krishna's energies, we know about Krishna's relationship with the material world, we know about Krishna's incarnations, we know a lot about Krishna, we have a lot of knowledge. And then dhyana, dhyana yoga. Dhyana yoga, sense and mind control. So in dhyana yoga, they have to control their senses and mind, they have to sit, meditate. We also have to engage our senses in the service of Krishna. Very difficult, right? It's important, the same thing. So you can see how these different elements of karma yoga, jnana yoga and dhyana yoga, they're all there in bhakti, in relation to Krishna. Engage the mind in remembering Krishna in the senses, in the service of Krishna. Okay, we're not going to do the group, the drama, but Prabhupada explains direct process. Factually, bhakti yoga is the ultimate goal. But to analyze bhakti yoga minutely, we have to understand these other yogas. So, if somebody says, why shall I take advantage of this elevator? I shall go step by step. He can go, but there is chance. If you take this bhakti yoga, immediately you take the help of the elevator. And within a second, you're on the hundredth floor. Direct process. This is bhakti yoga. We don't go up the stairs. We take the elevator. Go right to the top. And here's the, the verse, of course, the final verse of Bhagavad Gita. And of all yogis, one who always abides in me, thinks of me within himself, and re renders transcendental loving service to me, he is most intimately united with me in yoga, and is the highest of all. That is my opinion. If one is fortunate enough to come to the point of bhakti yoga, to be understood, he has surpassed all other yogas. Therefore, to become Krishna conscious is the highest stage of yoga. Just as when we speak of Himalaya, we're, we refer to the world's highest mountains, of which the highest peak, Mount Everest, is considered to be the culmination. So bhakti yoga. All right? I, I went very quickly through that, but there's not a lot of substance there. I think the main points you can quickly grasp. Right? We, we talked about Bhagavad Gita 6.10 to 14 about the mind, and then 33 to 34 about Astanga Yoga for the modern age. Bhakti Yoga can be practiced without having practiced Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Dhyana Yoga. We don't have to have done these other yoga. Simply we do Bhakti Yoga. And by doing Bhakti Yoga, automatically we cultivate the qualities of the Karma Yogi, the Jnana Yogi and the Dhyana Yogi. It's all there within the Bhakti Yoga process. And we showed you the different elements which are there within these other processes, right? Karma yoga, what's the main point there, which is there in bhakti yoga? Who remembers? Detachment from the <coughs> fruits of activities. Detachment, right, detachment. And how is the devotee detached? Attachment to Krishna. Yes, right. And jnana yoga, they have knowledge. What does a devotee do? Knowledge of Krishna's energy. Knowledge of Krishna's energy, knowledge of Krishna's relationship with the living entities and like that. Yeah? And what about Dhyana Yoga? 
Sense and mind control. Sense and mind control. And for the devotee? Sense us to serve Krishna and mind to uh, remember him. Very good. Yes. Very nice. All right. Prabhupada explains, Krishna consciousness means from the very beginning, directly, bhakti yoga, just like we have given many times the example, there is a staircase. You have to go to the highest floor, which is, say, 100th floor. So someone is on the 50th floor, somebody is on the 30th floor, somebody is on the 80th floor. So, if by coming to the particular floor, one thinks, oh, this is finished, then he is not progressing. One has to go to the end. The whole staircase can be called a yoga system, connecting, link. But don't be satisfied by keeping yourself on the 50th floor or 80th floor. Go to the highest platform, the 100th or 150th floor, that is Bhakti Yoga. Srila Prabhupada Ki. All right, any more questions? Prabhus, did that help? Any more questions? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Ask a question. Uh, Maharaj, previously uh, Prabhu was asking you a question regarding uh, Shantarasa. So in that you told they don't do or do any kind of service. So without uh, doing, is it mean that they don't do any kind of devotional service or how is it? Without doing that, how did they achieve to that position? Well, they achieved to that position by their devotion. They're attracted to Krishna simply by their devotion. They remember Krishna. Just like, you know, just like the four Kumaras, they always remember, they, you know, they, they, they're just absorbed in meditation, meditating on the Lord. And they don't actually do any service. So meditating on the Lord is also a kind of a devotional service, so is it like that? But there's no activity. If there's no activity, you're meant to engage. What do we say devotional service means? Hearing, chanting, remembering, right? So you're going to remember, first you have to hear and chant, and then remembrance will come. And worshipping and offering prayers, and there's nine angas. Yes, Maharaj, yeah. And uh, the other thing is like uh, Krishna's uh, flute and all, uh, they are all like, um, like uh, there is no difference between Krishna's paraphernalia and Krishna himself. But uh, the paraphernalia, they are all are like non-living entities, right? So um, how is it, Maharaj? Well, in the spiritual world, everything has consciousness. Everything is personal. All of Krishna's ornaments, his, his garland and everything, they're all personal. Then they all have consciousness? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh -huh. All right. Any more questions are there? I see somebody's got a yes, hand, hand up there. Yes. Yeah. Nityananda Goranga, is it? Nityalila. Yes. Nityalila Goranga. Yes, Maharaj. So, uh, in the uh, in the yoga, uh, like we go to link between different kinds of yogas. We say that uh, 6.47 uh, verse, last verse of uh, sixth chapter is towards dhyana yoga more. So is it more bhakti yoga or is dhyana yoga? Yogi namapi sarvesham madgate nantaratmana. That that works. Yogi namapi sarvesham madgate nantaratmanam. Is it? Sadhavan bhajati yoga. Yeah. Yes. Well, it it can be bhakti. It can be gyan, which comes to bhakti. There has so it to, is more bhakti than dhyana, right? 
Sorry? It's more bhakti than dhyana yoga. Yes, it's Not more dhyana. it's more bhakti, right? Because it's Krishna said Yogi Nama Pisarvisham. Who's the highest yogi? The highest yogi is not the jnani. The highest yogi is the bhakta. It's the one with bhakti who is the topmost yoga, not the jnani. The jnanis, they, they get to that process with only a lot of trouble. Krishna already described the process of jnan. After many births and deaths, one who is in, actually in knowledge surrenders to me. And such a soul is very rare. And so it takes many lifetimes to come to that platform by the path of jnana. But by bhakti, no, I was asking about meditation, dhyana yoga, meditation. Oh, dhyana so, meditation. Oh, you're talking about dhyana yoga, meditation. Yeah. Okay. So meditation. Yeah. That's the yoga ladder. But we're not talking. We're not going through the yoga ladder, right? There's no time for people to do all these things. You know, how many people would ever go through all these yoga levels to come from? Just like in Srimad Bhagavatam, we read about Kardama Muni, you know, he was doing Astanga Yoga for 10,000 years. You know, 10,000 years, and then the Lord came, and then he, the Lord said, yeah, I'm sending you a nice lady who will be your wife. And so he got married and he had Devahuti, and, you know, and then he lived a Grihastha life, and then later on he renounced. And then he went off as a sannyasi to absorb his mind in the Lord. So meditation, you know, Vishwamitra also was doing meditation. He had also problems. It's not a very secure platform. We said it's better to be engaged rather than to do karma sannyas. It's better to do karma yoga, to be actively engaged in the service of Krishna rather than to just stop activities. Unless one is very advanced, very advanced, then maybe they can sit down and restrain the senses and just absorb the mind in Krishna. But generally it's much better and much safer to be engaged. And the full engagement in the service of Krishna is what really protects us. Yes. Thank you. Uh-huh. So, so meditation is also very difficult in this Kali Yuga because the nature of our mind is so restless. And Arjuna was saying he couldn't do it. And Prabhupada was saying Arjuna couldn't do it. You know, he's a thousand, thousands of times better than us. And you think we could, you know, how can we do it? Yes, sir. One more question I got while you were explaining Navadha Bhakti, last question. So, uh, I always had this confusion. So, devotional service is not only these nine processes, it also, uh, whatever we do for Krishna, right? For, for temple, for preaching, it's also devotional service. And uh, remembering the Lord, uh, chanting is also devotional service, right? So, it's all... Well, included. Is that true? Well, the nine angas are there. Well, you say whatever we do, that, you know, it, we said that's karma yoga, if whatever you're doing, you offer it to Krishna. That's karma yoga. But bhakti yoga is we do what Krishna wants us to do, you know, and we want to, it begins with hearing and chanting, which is the real foundation of bhakti yoga. We have to hear for a long time, we have to chant, then remembrance of Krishna comes. And we could say, well, service, dashyam is also there, so whatever service I'm, I'm doing it for Krishna. Okay, somebody's working in the office, they're working for Krishna. Mm, yeah, it, it's possible, but it's not very easy to say that this is my bhakti yoga you know, working for Krishna in the office. Yeah, you can do it, you can do it. But uh, it's a great challenge to keep Krishna consciousness in that kind of atmosphere. Yeah. 
And uh, so that at least the services that we do for temple, cooking or balance or preaching, book distribution, that is direct devotional service. Oh, right? yes, that, yes, definitely. That's devotional service. And doing for the temple, yeah. So that is comes under Dasyam or... Well, yeah, generally it comes under dashyam, like that, cleaning the temple, or cooking for Krishna is what archanam, it's part of the archana process. You could also say, you know, cleaning the temple is also part of archana. Uh, yes, Maharaj. That clarifies. Thank you, Maharaj. But the, the, we want to have the right consciousness also, you know, keep the mind focused, I'm doing this for Krishna. And you said Krishna sees everyone equally. He sees the person on the altar and the person cleaning the temple room. He sees them the same. Not that someone's better than another. But the idea is to serve Krishna, yes. Use our senses and the mind also in the service of Krishna. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions here? Maharaj, one question just as a follow-up to 647 as Mataji was asking. Yes. Uh, I understood the reply was that this verse can be Bhakti Yoga or it can be uh, Dhyana Yoga. But I, I'm, I'm just pointing out some of the facts which actually indicate uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, that's the question. There are some of the facts which indicate this is pure bhakti. Because bhakti yoga starts from this verse, not from the next chapter, first verse. First point is that there is a mention of shraddha. Second is there's a mention of the word yukta tamo. Yukta tamo or yukta has got three superlative degrees. Yukta, this is, I'm, I've just made my handwritten notes as some many years ago probably. Yukta means engaged. Yukta Taraha means very well engaged. And Yukta Tamaha, which is what is used here, means totally engaged. And of course, Prabhupada also uses uh, some explanation on, or uh, spends time on some explanation on Bhajante, worship. Uh, bhajante is more than worship and bhajante or bhajanti can be used only with respect to supreme personality of Godhead. So, uh, looking at these facts, it seems that um, uh, Prabhupada is indicating this is, this yogi is a bhakti yogi and not a dhyana yogi. Please correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think you're right. But you remember the subject matter of the sixth chapter was really dhyana yoga. Right, the, the, this chapter, that chapter six, was dealing with jnana yoga, but it came to the conclusion of bhakti yoga. So that was why we, we say that from jnana yoga came to bhakti yoga. The chapter led us to that point to recognize the superiority, the ultimate position of the bhakti yogi. But that, certainly that final verse is very clear, it's emphasizing bhakti yoga. So I'm just trying to clarify because I, I thought, I heard uh, that there was more preponderance to bhakti and less towards dhyana yoga. To me, the reading of this verse indicated it's complete bhakti yoga complete. and no. there's no hint of dhyana yoga in this. Okay, very good, yeah. I agree. Yes, I would agree with you. Thank you, Maharaj. To the Thank trained you. eye, we can recognize the complete bhakti there in that verse. Certainly, usually that verse is always quoted in relation to bhakti. It would never be quoted in relation to jnana. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. All right, so um, I'll have to consult with Ojasvi about next week. I, I don't know if he insists he wants to do the open, the closed book. May have to, but we'll try to have another couple of sessions next weekend if possible. Let me see what he has to say. And we'll be in touch with you over the week. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Recording stopped. Thank you.